Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. So you'll have gathered probably where my interest in, in this topic uh, came about. I've been interested for a while in the uh, functions and roles and acquisition and display of uh, objects in medical museums. And this include, of course, not only specimens, but also models um, and images. Uh, coming up to the uh, centenary of the First World War, we at the English College, as, as elsewhere, um, looked into the history of, of surgery in the First World War, and that um, I found a very rich vein of, of material um, that I hadn't been expecting. And that broadly plugs into a wider interest as a trained Victorianist, I've been moving, edging very slowly into the 20th century. Uh, I used to get a nosebleed after 1914. I'm getting a bit better. I've reached 1930, and I'm still okay, but I can still see the sides of the pool, so that's okay. Um, and I've been looking at uh, both, you know, uh, academically and practically at training and how anatomists and pathologists and surgeons train and how they've trained and we've been doing some work around Gray's anatomy um, at work. Um, and we've also uh, had some really rich acquisitions recently that have been feeding into this at, as well. And you can see one here. Uh, this image by Dulce Pillars was part of a batch that came in the week before last. So this is very fresh to me. Um, I'll make the usual disclaimers about it being work in progress. Um, I mean, it's, it's extremely work in progress. So feedback from such an august audience as this would be very welcome. So I'm interested in a group of artists and artworks in the early 20th century in what uh, uh, one um, historian of scientific illustration recently called the image-saturated discipline of medicine. In this period that I'm looking at, which is sort of 1900 onwards for a couple of decades, the artwork isn't, hasn't really been studied as much as the previous centuries, and yet we're seeing ex rapid developments in the fields uh, that are being depicted. So surgery in particular, the decades leading up to and following 1900 is developing massively with uh, the growth of aseptic surgery and new techniques, and of course with the First World War, it's a rapid proliferation um, of new developments. And I'm very interested not in the great and the good and the grand and the famous, although they'll appear um, in the next 45 minutes or so, but in uh, what James Elkins calls utility graphics. I'm interested in what we might call illustrations, but there's difficulties with that term, as I'll come back to later. I'm interested in the images, the visual culture that comes about for not for uh, aesthetic purposes per se, but for clinical and educational purposes. I'm interested in the functions of images that are being used um, often in publications, but not always, and this reproducibility and the economics um, and the, uh, the functions and the utility are, are what interest me as much as the content themselves. And I'm interested, and one can't help but get interested in the artists that crafted them, the work collectives responsible for generating these images. So, broadly speaking, I'll be talking today about a series of relationships, the, following that well-worn historiography of the relationship between artist and anatomist, between text and image, between image and object, and especially between manual techniques for representing and photographic techniques. I was intrigued as to the enduring use of paper and pencil in this era of mechanical objectivity. But briefly, to give it some backstory, uh, we heard earlier in this excellent lecture series um, about the, um, uh, from Professor Nutton about the um, uh, frontispiece to, to Vesalius and Vesalius's work with 
we thought, Jan Stephen van Kalkar, the Flemish artist, but uh, as Professor Nutton told us, we think perhaps this was um, uh, now seems unlikely. Um, there's been a lot of historical interest in um, Albinus and his work with the art, um, artist Jan van der Laar on the right here. A little closer to home, uh, we know a great deal about the relationship between William Hunter and Jan van Rimsdyk, and of course, these are a series of increasingly troubled relationships, especially when the Hunter brothers um, uh, appear. So the uh, illustrations in the gravid uterus are taken by some to be the, the dawn of, the, uh, of a modern era of uh, anatomical representation. Um, his brother, meanwhile, John Hunter, is working with the artist William Bell, and it's just as tense a relationship Bell writes of Hunter's foul temper, but idolizes him nonetheless and spends a decade um, as his assistant, just as John Hunter had been William's assistant um, before. Uh, Ruth Richardson's done excellent work on the relationship between uh, Henry Gray and uh, Henry Van Dyke Carter. Um, and so we've got uh, one of the illustrations of the first editions of uh, Gray's Anatomy, as it came to be called, on your left, and on the right, the India proofs of Van Dyke Carter's illustrations for the first edition that we hold um, at the um, English College, which are just stunning, and we've been looking at them in great detail um, uh, uh, recently. This series of troubled relationships has become a sort of well-worn, uh, a great fun, but a well-worn story in the history of, of uh, anatomical art. Um, and we'll perhaps move away a little bit from that in, in what follows. Uh, in my broader interest, and the research I've been able to do here as well, I've been looking not only at two dimensions, but also at three. And I won't talk a, very much about waxes today in the end. I ran out a little bit of space. But uh, we know, of course, the importance of wax models in 18th and 19th century um, anatomy instruction. This is from the famous uh, collection of wax works by Joseph Town um, of Guy's Hospital, worked for 50 years on a series of stunning anatomical and pathological um, wax works um, at what's now the Gordon Museum. And, and uh, town is working there with Hodgkin and Bright and the other so-called guys men. So, so much as by way of uh, 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 preamble, what's about at the turn of the century? What's going on at around 1900 and through into the First World War? This period that hasn't been studied quite so much. And yet it's, an, I think, a crucial hinge in the production and consumption of uh, broadly speaking, medical illustrations. And there's a lot of new media and new techniques available, and yet there's an endurance of many older techniques. And this isn't a simple story of uh, innovation, you know, rubbing up against tradition. It's much more rich and, and, and textured than that. The new techniques um, available, um, photography by this point is relatively cheap and widespread. Um, and there's new photographic techniques like uh, photomicrography um, available uh, at the turn of the century and, the, of course, the, the, shown here, the stereoscopic, the Edinburgh stereoscopic atlas of anatomy. It was a favorite of mine. Um, all photographs, um, no artwork. The moving image is also available to uh, the medical profession as a training um, tool. So I was struck by the instruction laboratory in the U.S. Army Medical Museum, the principal medical museum in the U.S. is the Army Medical Museum, and they have an instruction laboratory who are charged with making models and making films. So these media rub shoulders largely happily. X-rays, of course, take, are taken up very, very quickly um, at the turn of the century. And there's an uh, example here of uh, First World War um, facial uh, um, reconstruction from our odontological collection. X-rays are undertaken surprisingly quickly in, in the field um, and take a little longer to make their way into the standard textbooks. 
Gray's uh, resists X-rays until 1938. But in this period, these early decades, uh, anatomical surgical medical publications are growing in number and in size, and multiple, multiple editions are available. Gray's Anatomy starts the century at a, a thousand pages with about a thousand illustrations, and by the Second World War has 1,500 pages still in the single volume with 1,300 illustrations, including by this point x-rays, 600 of them in color. So the sheer volume of illustration um, is striking, and in there you get this mix of uh, new illustrations. There's maybe 100 new illustrations for every edition, of x-rays, of color, different artists are in there, some of the artists I'll talk about today, as well as um, the, uh, a lot of um, Van Dyke Carter's original illustrations are still um, in there um, at that period. Cunningham's, too, a little closer to home, is of a similar scale to Gray's and similarly recycles images edition upon edition. Um, although Cunningham's introduces x-rays in 1922, a little bit earlier. Line drawings, very traditional technique, continue to be used long after halftones become economically feasible. Um, and textbooks recycle images from other textbooks. Cunningham's takes a whole bunch of uh, already existing images. There's a transfer of images from textbooks from into and back from instrument catalogues from the commercial sphere, and Claire Jones has talked about that in some detail in her excellent recent book. There's an economic element to this. A woodcut block could be used up to a quarter of a million times and still give good results. Away from publication and into teaching, into the lecture hall, illustrations, blackboard drawings are still used. Jameson here, um, here in Edinburgh is extremely adept um, with the blackboard and in fact his publications which we'll come back to later are based on his original blackboard drawings. This is an example of uh, one of the Lister roles we've got in the English College with my colleague uh, archivist Louise King there um, for scale. She's delighted as you can um, see. Um, and they're very simple. I mean these are probably from Agnes Lister's original sketches um, and then uh, projected by camera lucida and then uh, um, uh, uh, outlined by um, Francis Caird. Here at the uh, Anatomy Museum, there's a great and rather, I think, uh, underappreciated series of giant wall charts. Um, these media are still play a very important role well into the 20th century. But I want to concentrate among these, this multiplicity of media. I want to concentrate on three artists who use, for the most part, pastels, pen, pencil, and watercolor. And I want to look at the images that they create, uh, have a little look at a couple of them, perhaps in a little more detail, and then think about um, their utility, think about their relationship with each other. So the three artists I'll concentrate on today are Henry Tonks, shown here on the right, Kirkpatrick Maxwell, Dulcibel Pillars, and then, if I have time, which I think I won't, but I'm also interested, and we'll be moving on in due course to look in more detail at the uh, New Zealander called Thomas Kelsey, Sidney Sewell, and uh, Robert um, R. W. Matthews, who's um, local um, to Edinburgh. So, to take Henry Tonks first. Henry Tonks is the best known, I think, of these artists, perhaps you'd agree. Uh, has anyone come across any of the others that aren't Henry Tonks? You all, yes, <laughs> you would. Um, and is anyone who's come across Henry Tonks? Okay, well, he's maybe not as well known. So, Henry Tonks, um, uh, reasonably famously then, um, trained as a surgeon in the late 19th century, doesn't like it very much and becomes an artist instead and ends up as Slade professor, um, as professor of, of, um, of art at the, um, at the Slade. Um, when the First World War breaks out, he feels he ought to make himself useful and so volunteers, works on an ambulance for a while and ends up more or less as an orderly 
at the uh, uh, Duke of Cambridge Hospital in Aldershot. And it's there that the uh, pioneering self-promoter and plastic surgeon Harold Gillies finds out he has the famous Professor Tonks in his basement um, and gets him to undertake some surgical diagrams for these new techniques that the plastic surgeons and the uh, oral surgeons and the dental surgeons are using to put together, put back together the faces of the uh, service personnel injured in the trenches. So Tonks is originally engaged to do this sort of work, but very quickly he starts to undertake this sort of work as well as. This is Private Walter Ashworth of the 18th West Yorkshire Regiment, the so-called Bradford Pals, who was injured in the Somme and then was transported back to Aldershot and uh, endured three uh, facial operations for the uh, wound um, to his mouth and cheek. These pastels by Henry Tonks probably drawn at the patient's bedside. Pastel, as you'll know, is an unforgiving medium. To be as precise as this takes an exceptional and impressive skill. And Tonks produces very sensitive and faithful portrait. For portraits, these are now. He's gone well beyond his remit. These aren't particularly fit for purpose as clinical illustrations. Um, they flake, they're fragile, um, they're not kept in with the rest of the patient file. But his use of colour is striking, and we'll come back to this over and over again, a striking use of colour. The red of Ashworth's swollen lips in the pre-photo merges into the torn flesh of his cheek and then into the ghastly chasm torn into his face. The wound is clean by now, but nonetheless clearly agonizing, the bowl underneath reminding us of both the pain of the saline uh, washes that the patients would have had to endure on a regular basis, as well as the ignominy of uncontrolled saliva, of not being able to speak and not being able to eat. A lot of what Gillies and his colleagues were doing was um, around enabling the patients to recover enough to eat and to speak to very basic functions. Post-operative, his scars remain vivid. There's still the use of the red, and the eye is drawn to Ashworth's scars, but this is a tidier image. It's calmer. Arguably, it's more carefully rendered, as if Tonks is able to spend more time on it. The reddish hair that Ashworth, only 23, is already receding, has been tidied. Tonks has the time to colour the background, which there are 75 of these images surviving, and only a handful of them have a coloured background like this. And he's put, he's reclothed Ashworth. Ashworth gets his skin back, he gets his clothes back. This is, of course, the hospital uniform. Although in this case, interestingly, not the very striking red tie that they wore. Nonetheless, Ashworth remains isolated. He's decontextualized, and this stands in contrast. Tonks' peacetime work, rather chintzy interior portraits of society figures, are very busy. This is isolated. Ashworth stands alone against a neutral background. And his gaze is averted. He's turning slightly towards us now, post-operative, but his gaze is averted. And we see him exhibiting a, what... Gillies called a whimsical, one-sided expression which is not entirely unpleasant. And Gillies could be quite damning of those uh, operations that he saw weren't successful. There are similar qualities evident in the dual portrait of Harold Burbridge, of Burbage of the 20th Royal Fusiliers. He's much older than Ashworth when wounded. He's 37 and has a gunshot wound to his chin. It takes him a month to get to Aldershot, by which point his wound is already starting to heal, um, which uh, uh, pins his lip in a ghastly position, and again will give him problems eating and talking. Tonks does the initial picture, looks much rougher, seems hastier, there are smudges and clouds, Burbage is unkempt and bearded, his hair 
again, there's no particular reason in a clinical drawing to be paying such attention to the hair of the patients. Post-operative, he's calmer, he's tidier, he's clean-shaven. But we still see the ghostly scars that are the legacy of the procedures that he endured. There are 75 of these. I won't go through all 75, but you can, in the new Royal College of Surgeons of England book available online, um, uh, get the complete, for the first time, the com first time in full colour, the complete set of all of the Tonks um, images at the Royal College of Surgeons of England, and uh, there's three at UCL. And they're juxtaposed with a contemporary artist called Julia Midgley, who worked as a reportage artist who uh, uh, spent time with um, surgeons in training and service personnel in rehabilitation. I'm interested in the relationship with photography in the book. We put in all the corresponding photographic records that survived that we could match up. I'm interested, as I already mentioned, that these pastels aren't particularly fit for purpose. They're very fragile, they're friable. They're even now when they're framed at great expense, you know, we still have to be extremely careful with them. The relationship between Gillies and Tonks, as far as we can tell, was disappointingly collegial. Um, but there's a difference in status here. Tonks trained as a surgeon, Professor Tonks. Um, the relationship perhaps between Lieutenant Tonks, as he was, and the uh, patients who are usually privates, uh, um, private soldiers is perhaps more interesting. The second of the three artists I'd like to talk about in some detail is Kirkpatrick Maxwell, the son um, shown here. Maxwell is the son of a Scottish printer, uh, apprentice to a lithographer in Glasgow, trained in drawing and engraving, trained in, you know, the applied techniques. And he works at Glasgow, then at UCL, and later, much later, at Cambridge. During the First World War, he's sent by the Medical Research Committee, that which would become the Medical Research Council. They almost immediately, very early on, send out two pathological artists, not photographers, artists, out to the Western Front to sketch. And I think that itself tells a great deal about the utility of this sort of work in this period. And so we see Maxwell here at the makeshift laboratory at the casino in Boulogne, uh, where he worked under uh, the eccentric Almoth Wright and then a uh, young bacteriologist called um, Alexander Fleming, um, who I'm sure would never amount to anything. Maxwell also went out to the casualty clearing stations, the near frontline hospitals, and sketched patients and the implementation of, not new treatments, but the implementation of particular treatments and technologies, including here, immediately recognizable, the Thomas Splint, an iconic First World War uh, orthopedic device. And this relatively simple sketch, which I at first flicked past, looking for you know, more ghoulish, more ghastly, more dreadful wounds. And it was only when I came back to this, I looked a little more closely, I realized how much it spoke of Maxwell's style. It's carefully rendered. It's almost gentle, given where he was and what that soldier was going through. It reveals nothing of the chaos. This was undertaken at a casualty clearing station, uh, as you can see at the top, there's nothing there to reveal the chaos that's going around. I mean, these were often under fire. The blanket, and indeed the rest of the patient, drifts off into the distance, isolating the injury and the device. While at first glance one might think of it as rather sketchy, I'd argue that if you look closer, you see that the simple shading, the apparent deceptively simple shading, emphasizes the curvature of the handle and the tension of the supports, keeping the leg above the bed, above the um, stretcher. I was struck by the care that Maxwell took with the details, the rivets on the stretcher, the stitching on the leather at the top, as that is to say, the left-hand end of the, of the splint, and the knots keeping the splint um, airborne. The heavy lines on the metal and on the leg draw the eye 
and better, I suspect, to convert it for publication. Because these images that, and Maxwell under, completed around a thousand images uh, by the time he finished in, in France, and these images are principally intended for publication one way or another. This is probably the most widespread at the time. This is uh, Maxwell depicting another critical and iconic technique that became widespread during the First World War, the um, uh, Carol Dakin technique for wound irrigation. Again, it's simple. It's a simple composition, but it's not diagrammatic, not purely diagrammatic. Once again, the composition is framed by the blankets, the blank blankets and bedclothes and pillows in this case. And the, there's the tiniest of details and the important parts, the clamps and the tubes, the safety pins. Again, the patient is disembodied. There's no sense of the pain and discomfort in this particular case. And this would have gone out, this went out within the 1917 memorandum on the uh, uh, Carol Dakin technique, which went, was issued to every RAMC officer um, in a conflict zone. So every one of them witnessed Maxwell's clean, crisp, and light touch. It's not to say that he always removed the patient. Here we see the patient very clearly, complete with the pain and the discomfort. This is Private Scott exhibiting the effects of uh, gas, again, very characteristic of the First World War. This isn't a patient in peaceful sleep, but a patient comatose, slumped against the undrawn pillow, his mouth ajar. Sir George Makins, the surgeon, floats nearby. We don't know whether it was actually, this is him actually benignly looking down at that patient. It was on, it's on a sort of sketch pad, so he might have just been um, um, using it later. But it's nice to think that Makins might have been smiling down at the patient. As it is, when prepared for publication, Makins um, is removed. Uh, Maxwell had done a lot of work with Makins out in the, in the um, uh, first, uh, in the, in the, French Front, Macon's later president of the English College, and helps to catalogue our collection. I suggested this to our current president, but Miss Marks wasn't terribly keen. Very kind, um, but uh, not terribly keen on that. Again, Maxwell can't help but go beyond his, his remit. And we see Scott redrawn in pastels for the publication in the medical history of the war. He's not so subtle as Tonks in pastel, but we see Scott's pallor emphasized. We see the contrast heightened and the shadows deepened. Um, and this, I mean, speaks to me almost of a kind of hammer horror, the way that the shadowing works. I don't know if Maxwell intended that. But like the others, short of, you know, the faint hint of the button on Scott's shirt, and we'll come back to this later, Maxwell likes his buttons and his rivets and his, and his details. Scott's face being the important part, that's what's in colour, and otherwise he's disembodied, he's isolated. And we'll come back to this again and again in these artworks. I think, however, that Maxwell's more comfortable uh, with pencil and pastel. This is a very striking image. I don't know if you agree, that as far as I know, doesn't make it to publication. It's of a stomach wound, which almost certainly would have been fatal. The patient, unnamed, lies prone, exposed and vulnerable, his head thrown back, his gaze averted. The framing bedclothes draw back to reveal more than just the wound, and only his cocked leg provides a modicum of modesty. His hands rest gently on his thigh and on the bed. No indication in them or in his face of the agony he must have felt at that point. There's a sparing use of colour only on the patient, and this draws attention to the dark, brooding ugliness of the wound and of the bruising around it. And the shadows behind draw the gaze again and again, to the centre, to this wound. 
It's a quasi-religious composition, one might argue, and it puts me in mind a little of Smuglerius. It might be just because I'm in Edinburgh. A final First World War image from um, Maxwell. I won't dwell on this because I've uh, published on it. Social History Meds in the last issue. Um, so I won't dwell on it. But this is a very different sort of image. It's taken from a specimen. We know about the gunner from which this heart who was um, shot while resting on a gun carriage near a casualty clearing station. His heart then autopsied and brought back to the Army Medical War Collection of the Royal College of Surgeons. As an image, it's... It's very striking, very detailed, again, very isolated. Um, it's in original, it's in um, uh, blacks and whites and greys, um, but you get a sense of depth and a sense of just the carnage um, writ large upon a body by ordnance um, uh, fire. And on the page, it's published in multiple places, the British Journal of Surgery, here in the Medical History of the War, on the page, it almost bursts out beyond its frame. Of the thousand images that Maxwell compiled on the Western Front, almost all came back to the Royal College of Surgeons of England and were then destroyed in the Blitz in the Second World War, sadly. So we have the published versions of many of them, and the sketches that I show were from an album that he put together that he later gave to the college um, in the 1950s. And it may be from that that we have, like, the, the, the prone soldier. I think this may have included the ones that he took out from the gen his general work around the diagrams about techniques and so on. Post-war, he comes back to the UK um, and does work, as I've said, in both England and Scotland. Here, in the Royal College of Surgeons, uh, you have a rather striking set of proctoscopic images. I'm here to tell you not to Google that, and I'll spare you a deep critical analysis of all the images in the little roundels on the left, but the uh, organ on the right um, reveals, again, his use of isolation, uh, very rich use of, of colour. He illustrates for anatomists, histopathologists, proctologists, embryologists, and he also works uh, for a series of textbooks, including Gray's, Boyd and Hamilton's, and, for example, the 8th edition of Cunningham. The third artist is less well-known still. We know very little about her. Her name is Dulcibel Pillars. Uh, she was born in 1892 um, in Bristol, and she's later resident in Gloucestershire. Uh, we know that age 19, uh, she was an art student, but we don't know where she was being trained, but she was in Bristol. She never married, and she dies again in Bristol in 1961. Like Maxwell, she was a founding member of the Medical Artists Association in 1949. Now, of serendipity and the acquisition of archival and museum collections, you'll know as much as I do. Um, this particular collection is one of my favorite stories. Uh, my favorite acquisitions in the time we've been here, I was sat in my office and a member of council, Professor Derek Alderson, a fellow Geordie, wanders into my office with a bundle under his arm. Now, any heritage professional here will know that you have a sinking feeling when a senior stakeholder wanders in with a bundle under their arm because it's almost inevitably followed by a long explanation about strategic collection management. As it happens, within that bundle was a series of 25 images by Dulcibel Pillars that a histor as a historian I remain fascinated by. Fortunately, my archival colleagues were just as keen to have them. And even more fortunately for our purposes, um, there was nowhere in Bristol that was particularly keen on having them. So not only did these 25 images um, come in the year before last, I think that was, but the week before last, a fortnight ago, a matching 75 images came in thanks to uh, an orthopedic surgeon in Bristol, um, Gordon Bannister. These, he at least, came in a sort of quite smart album. So, pillars we know very little about. We know, however, that she, the bulk of the work that we have of hers, at least, 
um, was thanks to a collaboration with uh, William Ernest Hay Groves, the orthopedic surgeon um, who uh, um, edited, was the first and long-serving editor of uh, British Journal of Surgery. And we know that Pillars illustrated and certainly employed by him for a long period of time from the mid-First World War onwards, certainly to illustrate his many editions of his many very prolific textbook writer. So, for example, we see her clean, crisp style in his 1925 edition of Treating Fractures, the original um, that came in uh, with uh, Mr. Bannister on the left and the published version on the right. There's this diachronic relationship that I'll come back to between the images, the before and after we're seeing again. We're seeing the juxtaposition of inside and outside, which is a common trope in anatomical art, um, and of tools and bone, which is very appropriate for orthopedic. As far as we know, she undertook all of these diagrams for his synopsis of surgery, um, the edition from the same year. Again, we're seeing sparse. This is much more diagrammatic than Maxwell. And if it reminds you of an instrument catalogue, uh, as Claire Jones has told us, um, that's no coincidence. Her most stunning work, however, rarely gets published. This is the one uh, instance of the sort of work um, that I'm going to talk about in a moment that does get published. But in the archival holdings, and this is bone grafting, um, uh, sort of semi-diagrams of bone grafting operations. But in the archive that came in, there's this whole series of them. So take, for example, that of Private Humphreys in 1919. Probably from a swift sketch in theatre, we've got some early sort of rough versions and then tidied up later. Again, we're seeing here more so than Maxwell and Tonks that it's sanitized and isolated. And she's capturing in the main image a single instant with the details that are most important to the surgeon. This is far more fit for purpose of, as an image, I'd argue. We see no skin, no details of skin in any case, but rather the eye is focused on the clamps and the retractors. Her sparing use of colour highlights the elements crucial to the anatomy of the operation, the radial vein. One extensor, but not the others, is coloured. Coloured too is the periosteum wrapped around the graft, which I'm told by Mr Bannister wasn't actually terribly useful. Orthopaedic surgeons in the audience uh, might be able to correct me on that. She uses light very effectively to give depth the grafted bone seems to float in a weirdly hollow um, limb. I mean, as you know, my appointment letter to the university doesn't permit me to practice, um, but I imagine that there's a lot more going on during an operation than she shows here. But everything else is drawn back. I'm fascinated that she has the main diagram and then many subsidiary illustrations. So we've got a moment in time in the main, but then a sequence evident in the rest. There's also reproduction of an X-ray that I won't dwell on given time, but I find this fascinating that X-rays are being reproduced. We've got some of the X-rays in her file, but she reproduces them because she's able to do so to make it much simpler, much easier to see. Skiography, after all, the initial skiograms, X-rays, means the science of shadows. These aren't immediately readable um, to anyone, x-rays, they need to be, this technique needs to be learned. You need to learn to see. She crowds the page, and this is why I've shown you. Interestingly, Mr. Bannister brought with him a disc uh, that he'd had professionally rendered the photograph. But being medical, of course, all the images had been cleaned up. They were perfectly precise on perfectly white backgrounds. But you missed the clamps, and they, they'd cut out all the wonderful archival history of, of, the, of the images. And you can see that she's almost filled the page that she had available. You see legends with dotted lines, redolent of greys, greys, after all, famous for the halo of labels that went around its images, comparing with none on Tonks and very few in Maxwell's. <clears throat> 
Again, in Lance Corporal Whiting's case, we're seeing a sanitized operation, seeing watercolor and ink contrasted to devastating effect. We're seeing the limb, the rest of the limb, fading off into the distance, a technique that Maxwell used. Our eye is drawn to the terrible sharpness of the fractured bone. And in this instance, as opposed to the previous example, the flesh at the edge of the wound is ragged and textured. And again, we're focusing on the tools. There are no circular saws at work in this one, um, as with the published image. And fascinating as well, the use of dotted lines to indicate the continuation of the bone. Like many scientific images, Pillars is rendering the hidden visible. We're able to see inside the body. I'm told as well that uh, Haygrove's uh, technique of sawing off all the messy bits at the end of the bone actually made them much less likely um, uh, to heal, but I guess one lives and learns. So, these three artists are among a group that I'm enjoying and looking forward to looking at. Others include Sidney Sewell, who I won't dwell on, um, who was, like Maxwell, sent out to the front during the Great War, and then later does a great deal of work for textbooks, including, um, on the right, um, uh, James Berry's cleft palate um, and hair lip. I'm also intrigued by the work of R.W. Matthews, uh, with very rich holdings um, here in the Royal College. Trained in lithography and design at the Edinburgh College of Art, he works with David Middleton Gregg, the conservator here, shown here in agonizing detail the curvature of uh, the spine um, of a patient whose records are kept here. He also works with the university um, and uh, rather striking I hadn't seen very many sketches of the dissections of orangutans and the, but this one it strikes me is rather finely rendered he also publishes uh, uh, contributes to Cunningham's textbook and Jameson's illustrations of regional anatomy certainly the second batch of editions of those Matthews is closely involved with by this time he's on the staff of the publisher Liv um, E.N.S. Livingston. And these are described, his work described rather patronizingly by a fellow uh, Edinburgh medical artist as pleasing and anatomically accurate. And I guess you can't want for much more than that as a medical artist. He's also a founding member of the Medical Artists Association in 1949. I'm running short of time, so I won't dwell on the third dimension. This is Thomas Kelsey. Uh, the New Zealand um, uh, uh, sculptor um, who works on the patients, um, works on and for the uh, plastic surgery patients and surgeons, including this rather striking 1917 um, training model. And this relationship between two dimensions and three is important, as we can see here from an example, my favorite example of the 20th century importance of the relationship between image, object, and text. We have the student with his textbook, his image, and his object all together, um, and also his pipe, crucially important, of course. And the relationship between, there's a lot to be said about the relationship. You remember Maxwell sketched the, the heart the Maxwell sketch was from uh, museum collection. It's important to look at these images in their generated, in the context of their generation. So this is a, a by Pillars and it's taken from a specimen in the Royal College of Surgeons of England. This is a Matthews image next to the corresponding cast from the collections here. The relationship between two dimensional and three is very important. Also, so too the relationship between the different media. And there's two ways of looking at the relationships between images that I'm trying to think about. The first is synchronic images of a, from approximately the same time, but in different media and in different dimension. So this is Private William Kearsey, who's wounded in the First World War and treated at Sidcup. And there's a series of photographs. There's a pastel at the bottom by Henry Tonks, 
but also a watercolour at the top by Daryl Lindsay, the Australian uh, medical artist. Kearsey is an Australian patient. A life mask is made for clinical purposes. Um, the one at the top is now uh, at the Royal Aust Australasian College of Surgeons, and a cast of that mask was made and came back to Sid, um, uh, Sidcup um, in the 1990s and then came to us um, in 2011. This is a striking example of what philosopher of science William Wimsett calls a thicket of representation. And these copy relations are rich and complex. As far as we know, Tonks and Lindsay both drew from life. But the relationship between the photographs and the casts and the casts and the um, medical illustrations are rich and complex. More interesting, even more interesting perhaps, is the relationship between medical images and time. Pathology and surgery are highly time-sensitive disciplines. You need to sketch something at a particular time or it's going to change, whether by disease or by design. Sequences become crucial. So here we have sequences by pillars of operations, of Haygrove's operations. Um, Packer on the left from the archive and then from his uh, Haygrove's Treating Fractures book from 1922. Good examples of what Bruno Latour calls a cascade of images, a chain of representation. Think also of Tonks before and after pictures. These are the ones that we go back to again and again, although many of them are, are only um, one or the other. And Maxwell as well does a series of sequential images. And these are sequences reveal a great deal about my principal interest, which is in the use of the collections. Many, but not all, are for publication, where they are reproduced, where they circulate, where they act as proxies so that the patient and the practitioner or the specimen doesn't have to move. The images can circulate so that the object or the person or the technique doesn't have to. They're, for the most part, singular images of particular patients in particular time, from which the reader or the viewer is intended to make more general lessons. And they're clearly, one way or another, performing a didactic training function and including, although I won't dwell on it, um, a redrawing is an important part of that. Um, I was delighted when I went in to see our student Saturday in our teaching collection just this past Saturday. And from the centre of the museum, I could see three surgeons in three bays, each with a group of students. One with a PowerPoint, one holding a rib, and one drawing. It was quite wonderful. I didn't have one of those um, panoramic cameras, otherwise I would have taken it. Oh, this is uh, the notes in the back of the first edition of, of, of the Cunningham first edition, uh, Cunningham's um, textbook. <clears throat> So, if their actual use is elusive, you don't often come across um, this sort of example. Um, the study of the, uh, the artworks in their context tell us a great deal about their intended utility. And it tells us a great deal about the investment and the importance placed on extra textual elements of anatomical and surgical training, with objects, with illustrations, and of course with hands-on techniques. It's clear that there's a considerable amount of labor and investment that goes into these and the relationship between artist and anatomist, between surgeon and illustrator is crucial. And there's a story to be told about the work collectives, about the prosopography of these particular artisans. <clears throat> Martin Kemp, the art historian, not the member of Spandau Ballet, um, argued probably provocatively, that you know, there isn't much about anatomical artwork style after the first edition of Gray's. It all gets a bit messy, that it's you know, non-style becomes a style. I'd hope to have shown you today that that certainly isn't the case with this particular group of pathological draftsmen, as they describe themselves. And that 
Dustin and Gallison's account of the tension between mechanical objectivity and individual artistic interpretation um, is alive and well in this period, that interpretation endures against this backdrop of ostensibly objective procedure. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.